Good morning and welcome to episode 8 of Wake Up West Orange. We wanted to step it up a notch this week, so we were going to have a very prestigious individual uh, here on set. However, Tim, uh, they they couldn't make it today, so... Yeah, and uh, then we luckily got in touch with somebody, somebody else that might even be more prestigious than that, and uh, they also had to cancel. So, uh, Matt is with us today. Matt Messier, we got him. So. Yeah, he just happened to be up at the building, so <laughs> yeah. it, it worked out. Well, you know, real estate slow. <laughs> Well, we're grateful that you're here this morning. Very, yes. Well, I, I appreciate that wonderful introduction. <laughs> <laughs> now, I saw that you didn't have a coffee cup, that you brought a water bottle with you today. Correct. So, you don't drink coffee? You just... Nope. Uh, I'm not a coffee drinker. Uh, um, my family, uh, they all drink co coffee except for Caleb, and they love it, but I just never got into it. Okay, well, what about cereal? Do you have a favorite cereal? So my favorite cereal is Cocoa Krispies. Mm. Man, right? Then you have chocolate milk. You got yeah. chocolate milk. <laughs> and you know, when I was growing up, it was like there was Kellogg's and Post was like, who ate Post? There was nothing good about, you know, because you had Fruit Loops, Corn Pops. We used to call them Honey Smacks. Honey smacks, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, corn used to be called oh, Sugar Smacks. Sugar Smacks. Uh, sugar Frosted Flakes. Now they're Frosted Flakes. Anyway, mm -hmm. so Cocoa Krispies are my favorite. Well, and you travel quite a bit with your job. You've been yes. probably just about everywhere. Yeah, I don't like to fly. So I've, I've, I've flown, I flew years ago. I've been to France. I've been to China, um, Dayton. And uh, so, uh, you know, the three major places you want to go to <laughs> in your life. And, um, but no, so I do a lot of driving. And so pre-COVID, I probably did about 40,000, 45,000 miles a year. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And I'm sure you've got some great stories for, for your time on the road. Uh, yeah. You know, I've had some, um, I drive a lot. I've gone on a couple of road trips with Michael Wallace. He is like the best person to go on a road trip with. He's so nice. And, um, uh, you know, so, you know, we've gone to California together. We went to uh, Texas to see the Michigan game. But one kind of cool story is the first time I ever flew up, flew up First time I ever drove to California, pretty long drive. And I remember driving, I get to the, uh, was it Louisiana, Texas border? Mm -hmm. And it's mile marker 989, just for the state of Texas. Oh. And I remember thinking to myself, I made a serious mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but I told, I told uh, Beth and them, you know, I'm gonna go out. I, I really wanna just kinda get some alone time. And I'm gonna stop in New Mexico, a couple places and just kinda go into a park and like kind of connect with God, mm -hmm. you know, type thing. Anyway, so I do that. I stop at this place. I'm there like three or four hours and it, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. So go to a hotel. Next morning I get up. I've got a rental car. I stop at a light and I go to turn and it's like, boom, and my axle broke. Ooh. I mean, just cracked in half. The tire was like in. If I had been on the expressway or something, pretty serious. So um, I try to drive the car, and there's I get into a driveway at like a um, um, Jiffy Lube or whatever, and uh, um, and this driveway goes to a Jiffy Lube and a Dunkin' Donut, and I'm broken down, and people are like going crazy because they're trying to get to the Dunkin' Donut. I call the the Hertz company, and I call the guy, and this is an Impala. I'll never drive an Impala again, and um, so I call Hertz, and they said. Um, yeah, you know, they have one place in, um, in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and um, uh, we have one car left, and it's an Impala. <laughs> and, uh, but we close at, I forget, 12 o'clock, and we can't bring you, you know, the car, whatever. So I'm at this Jiffy Loop place, and the guy comes out, one of the guys that change oil. He says, hey, can I help you? And I said, ah, you know, and I, you know, there's no taxis in Las Cruces either. This is probably, I don't know, maybe there's Uber. But anyway, he says, I'm no problem. He says, put all your stuff in the back of my pickup truck, and um, I'll take you there. So I said, <laughs> okay. So he helps me get this car over to the side, and uh, Hertz is going to come later and pick it up. We get in the, uh, we get in this truck. It's like a 20-minute drive. And uh, we get, and we start driving, and he starts telling me about, his relationship with Jesus Christ. And he starts asking me if I'm a believer. And I said, yeah, I'm a, you know, a believer. And we start talking about God and all that. And uh, we get to the, the Hertz place and <clears throat> I said, well, here's, you know, here's like 20 bucks, just, you know, 
for your gas and your time. He says, no, 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 I, I don't want to. I don't want to take any of your money. The only reason I help people is be, so people can see Jesus in me. Hmm. I was like, wow. So I take get my Impala, and uh, I'm driving, and I'm thinking to myself, going to California. I told my family I'm stop at these like remote places to try to get in tune with God. And I found God at the Jiffy Lube in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So for me, that guy was worth that, that trip because it just, it just filled me spiritually. Um, so I don't know. So I don't think you need to be like, you know, back in the day, the old hermits and whatever, kind of going out to find God. You know, if you're looking for God, he'll find you. Mm -hmm. And he just used this guy yeah. at the Jiffy Lube place. So it was great. I mean, that's, so that's my favorite story. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, when, when I was a kid, my grandparents had a 32-foot travel trailer that they pulled behind a Chevy Suburban. And we would spend probably three weeks or so over the course of the summer, my brother and I, in the back seat as they would fight over, no, you need to take this exit. No, you need to make that turn. And uh, navigating every KOA there was. And I don't know, I, I don't know that we have taken very many family road trips, and I think it all dates back to that. So I've, I've got a lot of respect for <laughs> oh. you, you doing <clears throat> all of that. Yeah, you know, we went out west for a month, uh, 28 days or whatever it was. <clears throat> and um, I joke around. I love my kids, but I told Beth after that trip, I really like our kids less now than when we started. <laughs> <laughs> That's my fear. That's why we haven't taken it. And I joke trip. around. It was a great trip. We had a good time. But, you know, when you're with somebody that long, it's just, you know, yes. it's almost like what we're experiencing now when you're in a house with, you know, people and, and um, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, um, it, it kind of wears a little bit. It really mm -hmm. does. What about you, Tim? Um, well, kind of the same thing. We went on a lot of trips when I was a kid. My dad preached, so we traveled all over the place. And, um, and I've had a lot of trips since then, like mission trips and stuff. But what I really vividly remember in the 70s, I don't know about y'all, but where I grew up and stuff, nobody wore their seatbelts. Uh, to the point that I remember walking in our garage and seeing where dad had cut them out of the cars and they were just hanging in the garage. We just didn't use them. And I remember us driving to Arizona or wherever. And I would be, we had a, a long, we called it the banana. It was this massive car and had a big back window. It was like a ledge area. And I slept up there and would just wave at people <laughs> as, as they drove by. And I remember doing that. And now I think, they would have been arrested. I would have been yes. given to another family. You can't do that anymore. But it was just so, I loved it. I loved just lying there waving at truckers or whoever, you know. But now I think back, I'm like, I could have died. I mean, it, like, the, he could have slammed on the brakes, not just like jumped in the front yeah. of the car. He like a <laughs> missile. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, lots of funny stories, though. Well, and what about your journey that led you here to West Orange? Um, everybody knows from Detroit, and um, I'm the youngest of four boys. So my mom and dad moved down here. They owned a bunch of apartments and so forth. My dad was a Korean combat vet, and it's pretty cold, I guess, in Korea. And he had always wanted to get away from the cold. So um, he had bought some apartments and whatever. And so in 83, they moved down here. And um, so my brother, Mike, took over the business for my dad, you know, selling churches. And, and so I worked with my brother for a year and loved my brother just wasn't a good fit. And uh, so I was like, you know what, kind of miss my mom a lot. And so um, moved down here in um, September 84. And uh, we were at um, attending Concord at the time. And um, that's where I met Beth. And, um, um, and then we were there for, for a number of years. And then um, just felt that a change uh, was needed. And uh, so uh, we came over here to West Orange, I don't know how long ago, maybe 15 years ago, somewhere in there, and um, have been here since. So You've now been a shepherd for many years uh, here and uh, helping us through you know, different uh, transitions and, and different um, endeavors. But uh, with your line of work and what you do and, and being with, with uh, different churches and different groups, with the whole COVID-19 terrain that we're now navigating, what is an insight or something more current that you have, uh, you know, kind of observed during this time with what you do with your work? Like, like what's something maybe that we need to be thinking of <clears throat> as a church family at West Orange, for example, as far as 
you know, change is already here. How do we change, adapt? Sure. That kind of. Well, you know, I, I'm a firm believer. When you look in First Corinthians, uh, it talks about that the church, the body of Christ, is here for two reasons. One is to help reach lost people, and the other is to encourage each other. So if you can develop ministry around those two things, I think you're doing things right. The rest is, not that it's not important, but that's, if you remember, they came in, you know, but, you know, people, there's no interpreter, people come in, they're crazy, and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So I say all that to say, um, I think the church, if you look throughout history, this is probably a way longer answer than you want, but if you look through history, the church has always been changing. You look at the Jewish church, and then, you know, you look at when the Gentiles came in, how they did church was completely, di many ways different mm -hmm. than how the, the Jewish church was doing. So the idea that it's this inflexible organization, which some people have, no matter the denomination, is just, I don't think, a biblical concept. Um, obviously, there's certain principles, who Jesus is, and, you know, the idea of uh, the resurrection of Christ, and all those type of things. There are non-negotiables, but how we do it, uh, is very negotiable in my mind. And so um, so I say all that to say, so in talking to a number of churches, what I think it has taught is, number one, that we live in a society, and we know this, that is just so much more digital and electronic and all that. I mean, even, you know, we're doing teams at my uh, office and, you know, where you talk to everybody and you got, uh, you got Zoom calls. I've had more Zoom calls than, you know, whatever uh -huh. and so so i say all that to say some of the groups that i've talked to is that they said this they said we what we're discovering is that we're actually not a physical church with a digital presence but we're becoming a digital church with a physical presence and i say you know what does that mean mm -hmm. and what they're saying is is that a lot of times and this is this is you know if you go back even further like you'd have the big mega churches that is pretty much gone because it was like, hey, let's keep building these huge auditoriums and whatever. And everybody has to come to us. And so then what happened is that you started having multi-site churches. And, um, and that still is going to continue. But even some of these multi-site churches we've talked to, they've said, you know, with, with the, the people we're encountering digitally, um, with the connections we're making, where people are actually giving, where there's these Bible studies going on, like you guys are sending out and mm -hmm. so forth, mm -hmm. we, we can reach way more people on a digital platform, have less real estate, and that cost of that real estate can go into more ministry instead of you know insurance and things of that nature. So we see ourselves becoming more of a digital church with a physical presence. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a complete um, change of perspective. Mm -hmm. And the exciting thing is, um, and uh, many years ago, uh, the, uh, Kenny and Jerry and I, Rich, and I think Tom, uh, we went up to Atlanta to, to this uh, elders. That's Randy not, Harris, yep. um, he was talking, and he says this, Christians have a very, Christians need to remember this, the church is never in trouble. You know, we're all concerned, oh, they're going to do this, do that. The church is never in trouble. It's like, it's like, you know, when you're discussing, when, if, you know, my kids or I, I'm upset with God sometimes. God is big enough to handle me upset. Now, I don't want to be disrespectful. Sometimes I'm disrespectful. But the point is, God can't handle, can handle anything. And he certainly can take care of his church that Jesus died for. So I think we need to be, to me, we need to have more faith that God is in control. And I don't have to micromanage everything, which I have a problem with, uh, micromanage everything. So I would say that's the number one thing I've seen. We've seen churches that their giving has increased. We've seen uh, churches where their giving has certainly decreased. This is going to be, um, um, I, I would say that most of the groups I've talked to said this COVID-19 is going to probably reduce their fellowship by 10%. So we see a number of properties coming on the market, mainly urban and rural. Um, and uh, that's sad in one way, but in other ways, hey, uh, hopefully people are there can connect with a, a church that actually is, you know, going out and doing some ministry. Because a lot of times together, we can certainly achieve more. Um, so, um, so again, I think if you talk to people, you know, if you talk to people 500 years ago during the Black Plague, 600 years ago actually, 
Um, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world, the church, da, da. no. And then, you know, you look at all these events in history, um, you know, and the church has grown in adversity. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if, you know, for us to measure success, um, I don't know if it's numbers, but it's attitude and faith. And uh, I think that in these times of adversity, if we have people whose faith is increased, we're successful. That's definitely a, a different paradigm and one for us to you know, think ourselves. We consider ourselves at West Orange to always have a, a strength and face-to-face -face ministry, but yet yeah, to reimagine and rethink now, you know, how, how can we make it a, a strong point of ours to um, those digital platforms and, and other ways that, that our cult, it's in our culture and it's, it's what the youngest generation, you know, they're way more familiar with that than us. I remember when we were talking in our, some of our discussions with our ministry leaders, ministry team and shepherds uh, right before COVID, it was the last in-person meeting we had, we were talking about vision and future. And, uh, and I remember just kind of saying towards the end, it wasn't like a formal statement of the group, but it was like, yeah, we need to do those things. God gave us brains and things to, to, to think about, but this church has been here 90 years and that's not because of man's ingenuity. That's because of God's faithfulness. And, uh, but one of the things that I really appreciate about you, Matt, other than your humor, we love your humor. You, you light things up, but on a very serious level, you, you know, the, the work of the church is the most important work in the world. And, and Matt is always really encouraging us being light, not heat, as you often say, but you know, let's let's be mission driven, mission minded. Um, let's let's um, you know always forward thinking and not being married to the past or to a monument, uh, but but really being uh, you know married to Christ and to His mission. So appreciate the way that you uh, help our whole team to think in that direction. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I'm more heat than light too often, so I'm just slowly working on that. And <laughs> that's the nice thing to be a part of this church. This church is a very kind and loving, family-oriented church. I mean, I can tell you, I I I'm with a lot of churches, and uh, the dysfunctionality uh, mm -hmm. on some of these things. That's just it's like, you know, in here there's always um, a sense of love, and kindness, and forgiveness, and um, you know. My dad, I got to do my, I got some things for you for the, okay. whatever, my dad. But my dad always told me, he said, uh, if you keep God in your plans, he'll keep you in his. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if we, if that's our focus, he's going to use you. Mm -hmm. And if you suddenly find, whether it's individually or the church as a whole is not being used, you better sit back a little bit and see if you're really in his plans. Or is it your plan? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I appreciate that. But I, I think that. Certainly, our congregation um, uh, it really wants to be in the plan of God, you know. And uh, sometimes that's really scary. I can tell you that, you know. We all got our plan B, don't we? <laughs> so, anyway. Well, um, thank you, Matt, so much for being with us today and sharing your thoughts and uh, being such a great example and uh, being a part of what we do here. Uh, we wouldn't be who we are without you. And uh, I mean that in a positive way. <laughs> well, okay. Because <laughs> you're... you're <laughs> <laughs> You've been a friend to me and so many others, and I think a lot of people look up to your family and uh, love the fact that y'all are part of, of our family here. So thanks. Thanks for joining us today. Well, I'm going to say one more thing. Okay. Not because I have to have the last word. Well, Angie gets that anyway. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, but I was going to say this since we're going to have thousands of people watching this. Uh, oh, yeah. And, uh, but obviously a lot of Internationally. Them, internationally. Too, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right, yes right. Uh, yeah. Um, I, you do know that. Alabama's not another country, okay? Just so you know. <laughs> Go ahead. Is that what you were going to say? No. Oh. I was going to say that we are truly blessed to have a great staff. And I'm not just saying this because the ministers are here and, the, you know, Christine and Brandy and Emily, they're not here. But uh, we have a really, really great staff that, uh, and ministers who get along well, which is really important, who present a great message. Um, I can tell you that the last two weeks that I've, you know, that we've been meeting, um, the lessons have been excellent from both of you, and um, it's um, it's something our kids can understand. It's what adults can understand. But it held, during this whole time during the digital phase, it's been great. Nobody really understands how much Tim does. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's our 
He's our youth leader. He's our worship leader. He's getting ready to go to the beach. On a trip, yeah. On a trip for... Uh, for a week. Too long. Yeah, the whole yeah point for a is week. It's, it's like, you know, here, the point that I'm trying to make is that I personally wouldn't want to be with 25 or whatever it is, teenagers uh, on something like that. And you're away from, you know, your surroundings and all that. That's hard work. And so, um, so just want to, you know, I, I would say the one thing in, in leadership that, that I think the congregation and everybody else can do, the elders, is that we need to say thank you more mm. to the people that are doing a lot of these things. So I like to end before you, I mean, you're going to end it, but uh, <laughs> uh, as to just say thank you to you guys for just doing stuff like this, trying to keep us connected. Um, and uh, we appreciate you greatly and love you very much. Thank, thank you, you for those nice words, Matt. And thank you everybody for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.